Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 14, with Yorgos Panagiotakis. My name is Donnie, host of the Free Dive Cafe. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and fears and personal philosophies of the merry band of breath holders known as free divers. The Free Dive Cafe lives mainly at freedivecafe.com. All the episodes, show notes and the new blog can be found there. Make sure you visit the Facebook page too. Go to facebook.com slash freedivecafe podcast and you'll find it there. Hit the like button and share it with your friends, of course. So December is upon us. I can't believe how fast we got to this point, how many interviews I've done. This is number 14 going live, but there are many more already recorded and many, many more free diving athletes and personalities who are lined up to do interviews next year. Essentially, it's gonna be business as usual for the Free Dive Cafe. In March next year, I'm going to head off to the beautiful island of Gili Air in Indonesia to do my IDA instructor course. It's going to be an amazing seven weeks of daily diving where I hope to successfully complete my course and make some healthy developments in my own diving. But for all you diehards out there, don't worry. The podcast is still going to be coming out at least twice a month, perhaps three times a month, depending on how the Patreon campaign is doing. And I hope to get some other good content from my time in Indo, write a few blog posts about the instructor course process, maybe do some video and log my diving progression or lack thereof. So we're at a critical point now where we have uh, 31 patrons supporting the show through Patreon. That means only four more patrons are needed until we access that next level and start releasing three episodes a month instead of the usual two. When that happens, I'll try and release one every 10 days or so. There are many awesome interviews recorded already you could get access to quicker, such as uh, Aaron Solomons, uh, Omar Leuchi, and Sayori Kinoshita. If you want more Free Dive Cafe, four of you need to head over to freedivecafe.com now and hit the support the podcast button and you'll be taken to our Patreon page where you can choose to donate a few dollars a month to the show. Any amount is appreciated, of course, but I always suggest about four or five bucks or whatever the price of a coffee is in your country. This is a cafe after all and I need coffee or tea to get all this work done. To everyone who is supporting the show already, thank you a million times. I try and send everyone a personal message. I'm sorry if any of you have slipped through the nets. Um, I just can't tell you enough how lovely it is to get your pledge and all the kind words that often come with it. All right, on today's show is an amazing guest, world record holder Yorgos Panagiotakis, one of my favorite guests I've had so far, I think. Uh, we get into all the technicalities of training and eating and living the life of a top freediving athlete. George is passionate about freediving and has a lot to teach us. So who is George? George is a world champion freediver. He's a national record holder from Greece. He achieved a 300 meter distance in dynamic, which is the current world record. He currently lives in Cyprus and now works as a personal trainer and Ida freediving instructor. Throughout his journey in freediving, he has the pleasure of changing the lives and athletic performances of many people around the freediving world through his online coaching services. I hope you enjoy listening to this interview as much as I did recording it. Okay guys, let's dive. Yeah, first of all, just want to say thanks a million times for coming on the show and sharing your story and um, answering the questions that I have. Uh, it's really nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge in, uh, in your public. Uh, you're in Greece. You're from Greece originally, right? Yeah, I was born in uh, Pyrenees uh, next to the port. Okay. And yeah. 
But I left when I was eight years old and I went to live in a Greek island called Lesbos Mytilini. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, how to discover free diving? Actually, during my summer holidays when I was uh, 13 years old, I discovered a popular magazine. Actually, it was not a free diving magazine, which had the subtitle Seven Minutes Without Air. So I was curious, how was that possible? And I opened the magazine to read the article. And uh, in the last paragraph were a few words uh, founded and information about the Freediving National Federation and uh, how to become a member in order to learn this sport and uh, to participate in a competition. And uh, this is how the story began for me. Uh, so you were how old? Uh, I'm uh, 29 years old. Uh, and at the time you first discovered freediving when you found the magazine? Uh, I was... Um, 13 years old. Okay, so quite young. Okay, and so quite young, yes, but uh, it was not so serious. Uh, it was so serious. Um, actually, I was always interested in competition. Uh, from a young age, I was a competitive swimmer and a fin swimmer from 7 uh, to 60 years old, and uh, I was uh, distinguished in many national championship competitions. So at the age of uh, 70, uh, 17, due to the difficulties and the very demanding schedule regarding my studies and uh, swimming workouts, I took the decision to stop my swimming career and start uh, free diving. So, um, however, I didn't want to stop uh, the avocation with the element of water and uh, start free diving. Mm. So, from a very young age, you've been very comfortable in the water and also um, in a competitive environment as well. That's something that you're very much used to. Yeah, yeah. Um, from a very young age, I did the swimming about uh, seven to six kilometers uh, per day because I was a competitive swimmer and uh, later on uh, for uh, at last uh, um, three to four years before I st before I ending up my my swimming career I do fin swimming I did fin swimming so I was uh, very comfortable with uh, monofin and uh, brace stroke uh, brace stroke technique and swimming also when you first started to free dive did you attend a course was there an instructor or a coach who you went to for your first classes um, uh, for my for my instru instructor course started at uh, actually three years ago, not a very near, a very a young age. Um, um, I do I do I did my course also, and um, actually it was uh, it was not so so difficult. Um, I started um, I started the course, and uh, later on I started the competitive uh, free diving quite easy. So it was only three years ago that you started competitive free diving. Um, actually, it was uh, eight, but uh, for the instructor course, I started three years uh, right. later. Um, I think sorry, I think we misunderstood each other. Um, my my question was, um, who did you do your first free diving course with? Like when you were younger, who was your first teacher? Ah, my first teacher was um, Stavros Kastrenakis. Okay. Uh, it was um, seven years before. Uh, it was at uh, the second level, but uh, I was attending. Uh, I was attending on the course um, just for fun, just to to see how how is the free diving, how uh, to learn the physiology, to learn the uh, the safety about that. And after um, three or four years, uh, I finished my my instructor course with uh, Saba Saba in uh, Limassol uh, here in Cyprus. Actually, now I'm living in Cyprus for uh, for a job, not in uh, Paros or in Italy. I left in Mytilene um, before uh, three or four years old, just for working. And uh, I'm here now in Cyprus and uh, teaching free diving and lesson swimming. Oh, okay. swimming lessons. So, um, are you a free diving instructor as your regular job? Um, yes, but I'm um, doing free diving courses only in my free time. So, my free time is a little bit uh, limited now, right now. So, I'm doing. Um, not so many courses uh, per year, right. about uh, two or three courses per year. Just so, do you have another job or another profession besides free diving? Um, yeah, I'm a, speci a specified uh, personal trainer, uh, weightlifting trainer actually, and also swimming and uh, baby swimming instructor. Okay, a baby swimming instructor. Yeah, baby swimming instructor. Right? It's a uh, babies uh, around the. Uh, Four months to three years old to dive and to swim. Actually, oh wow, this would be very interesting to see. I didn't, I didn't know that you start them that young. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm quite interested in your um, your your bodybuilding education background and things like that. But we'll we'll move into that a little bit later. Um, 
So you are you're one of the top free diving athletes in the world um, in the pool disciplines. Um, so you're basically in the water full time for your for your 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 daily day to day job, right? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult to compare a job full time job and a daily training. It's not just for fun. It's a daily it's a daily activi act activity. Mm -hmm. You know. And where do you train now? Um, I'm training in Cyprus and uh, mainly in pool. Right. So there's a mainly pool in the city where you live and you just train there each day? Yeah, I'm very lucky about that. Um, uh, I have a swimming, pool, a swimming pool 50 meters uh, far, uh, 50, meters, uh, 50 meters long, about uh, 50 minutes away from a house. So I, I took the decision uh, three years ago to, to train every day and uh, to go to the pool every morning uh, from 7.30 to 8.30 and then uh, I start my, my working plans all day. Right. So a pretty busy schedule. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Talk us through your training schedule. How often do you train per week and um, what kind of training do you do? Um, well, I'm training uh, six uh, days per week for about uh, 60 to 70 minutes per time um yeah per time and um i usually do a monofin uh, monofin swimming for dynamic because it's my specialist uh, for dynamic apnea um swimming uh, swimming a lot about um, three to four kilometers per day in my basic preparation with a lot of drills and uh, an apnea drills underwater um, um and in generally, I do only physical conditioning in about uh, six, um, about four to six months in uh, the whole year plan. Do you mean uh, physical training um, that is complementary to your free diving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very physical training. Um, actually, the problem about apnea training, the apnea the apnea training generally in the particular of uh, CO2 and the oxygen to tables, have a strange and very negative effect on the nervous system um, so that they get soaked to, to a great extent and honestly can keep a long uh, to can keep a very long in, uh, in plateau so if you are uh, using to, to do a very long apnea training uh, sooner or later you will hit a plateau so this is my uh, this is how I changed my training program uh, since uh, 2013, when I cooperated with my coach uh, George Yorgas from Greece, this is the um, this is the difference between my old uh, training uh, schedule with a new one. So I put a lot of physical conditioning with my new training schedule, and this is how I go how I go uh, how I add uh, more uh, meters in dynamic apnea. Right. Right now. So what what kind of physical conditioning specifically would you do? Um, especially on the surface with a middle snorkel and uh, monofin is a very simple exercises uh, uh, to, to take a mileage uh, on my training just uh, three or four kilometers uh, long term uh, long term aerobic conditioning uh, for the first uh, for the first weeks and uh, later later on more specifically uh, I do more anaerobic uh, training uh, underwater and on the surface also. Right. So you, you're periodizing your training so that you can peak at the right time for the competitions that you wish to take part in. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, the last uh, 20 days before a big competition, I, I start cutting my, my, millets, uh, my millets preparation uh, for uh, surface swimming. And I start to to, to putting more uh, apnea apnea stimulation underwater with the long uh, apnea performances in order to get in more shape and to to get my, to, uh, to getting have a better tapering on the competition. Right. Now you said that the um, the um, apnea training, when done at a at an intense level for a long period of time, has a really negative effect on the nervous system. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just explain a little bit about what kind of um, symptoms you might feel that uh, that the nervous system is that indicate that the nervous system is under yeah. a lot of stress? Um, I cannot explain very well. Um, it's a very strange 
uh, how you feel when you're uh, using uh, to do CO2 tables or oxygen uh, or oxygen tablet, but it has very difficult uh, negative effect on uh, your nervous system and uh, it affects on your sleep, bad uh, quality of your sleep. Uh, you have a bad lack of uh, motivation. Uh, you don't want to, to hold your breath, uh, the simpler and the simpler words. Uh, so you have a very low motivation to to achieve uh, small uh, static apnea uh, performances uh, in a long term way. So I decided to stop all these uh, simple tables of my training and uh, to change uh, a little bit different. Uh, to change a little bit uh, different for my preparation and uh, my schedule working. Um, <clears throat> right, let's backtrack a little bit um, uh, to a couple of years ago. Um, you, in 2016, so last year, you um, became the first free diver in the world to reach the 300 meter mark in dynamic apnea. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk... Actually, I was, not, uh, I was not the first person. Uh, I was the first person in AIDA history, All right, okay, not in uh, free diving uh, in generally. Uh, the first man, it was uh, Arthur Bory, uh, Bory from, uh, from France. And, uh, he did it in uh, 2016, um, three weeks uh, before my, uh, my record. So it was in Simas. But uh, in AIDA history, I did uh, first. Uh, I was the first man in, who did uh, the three hundred meter mark. All right. First. So, and you only missed it by three weeks as well. So it's uh, yeah. it's almost like the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what what was involved in um, achieving that uh, huge dive? Um, you mean actually how well, I prepare myself to achieve this? Uh... First of all, did you ever think that you would end up achieving something like that? Um, <laughs> from the beginning, it was uh, actually dynamic apnea. It was not my favorite one discipline. Uh, it just happened uh, along the way. So uh, from the very uh, from the very beginning, it was very difficult to accomplish. Uh, uh, big uh, performances in dynamic apnea. So I was uh, stuck at uh, 150 meters for uh, two or three years, maybe or four years. It was very difficult to to pass this limit. But uh, the main problem and the main issue was uh, the training. Uh, I was not put a lot of training in uh, this discipline. Uh, after that, uh, when I was decided, uh, was deciding to, to put a lot of work, uh, good things happened after that, and uh, started gradually increasing my my distances and uh, meters for the, for this discipline. But uh, it was uh, impossible for me to imagine uh, to, to achieve uh, 300 meters. Right. You well, know, you said that for three or four years you were kind of stuck around the 150 meter mark. Um, yeah. So to actually double that is mm. a pretty huge achievement. What what was it about your training that was wrong in the first place? And what did you do to change it that you think made the biggest difference? Or was it just that you put so much more work into it? Uh, first of all, I just put a lot of work in, uh, in, the in dynamic and in, in, in pool uh, training generally. I gradually increasing my pool workouts uh, twice per week so I did uh, three times per week training before uh, I start to increasing so after that I had six pool workouts per week with a lot of more intensity but uh, that was the key of my success one of the key of my success was to increase my intensity of um, every workout so I gradually increase uh, the distances and the intensity of the of every workout so I put a lot of anaerobic physical uh, conditioning, and um, also I train a lot of uh, diving reflex in order to have the greatest uh, benefit in economy. Uh, to train diving reflex, I start adding a lot of uh, underwater speed training with empty lungs, so the body starts immediately to work with low oxygen. Consumption, right? So yes, so you would um you would do a an exhale dive and then uh, just swim at a very high intensity with fins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. FRC dive or empty lung or reverse empty lung dive. Right. So, do you would you ever do something? Would you ever work with like a a cold bath or something like that as well as a preparation for the dive reflex? Mm, cold bath before my start uh, before starting my tent. You mean? Yes. Mm, um, actually, I was using a little bit, but uh, I didn't find any differences in a long uh, in a long apnea in the, the final apnea performance. You know. Right. I just um, I just um, like to stay focused on. Uh, the simple method of no warm-up dive, just relaxation about uh, just relaxing about uh, ten minutes before my maximum attempt, and that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. And then just go for it. Yeah. You have a coach, uh, George Yorgas. George Yorgas. Yeah. Exactly. He seems to have played a, an especially important part in your development. Can you tell us a little bit about him and how he's helped to get you to where you are now? Yeah, yeah. The, actually, George Yorgas is a professional coach. Um, he was a professional athlete in his, in free diving, so he specialized in uh, dynamic. Also, he has a national record in dynamic with stereo fins, with uh, 151 meters um, at uh, in 2000. So when I was starting my free diving career, and after four years of uh, a lot of uh, consciousness and a lot of uh, uh, but uh, schedule and working, and uh, I ask I ask him to to cooperate each other. So the story begins with uh, with George and me, and uh, after this uh, we start to gradually increasing uh, the depth, and uh, actually increasing the, the distances in the water, which ends in the plan. Um, so it was a very good uh, option for me to to to, to cooperate with uh, George. Mm. Uh, and does he is he with you in Cyprus now? Uh, no, he's living in uh, Athens, and so we're cooperating uh, online. Uh -huh. So he sent me the, the program, and uh, we're communicating to each That's... other uh, with Skype. Yeah, this is the difficult part because uh, I was training with a buddy, but I have no coach out of the pool. So you do have someone that you train with uh, at the pool. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not necessary. It's actually not 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 necessary for me because uh, I do a lot of uh, surface swimming uh, in a long period of time, and I don't know, want actually a body to to cover me underwater. Yeah. But of course, for safety reasons, uh, I would train together with another another guy, another athlete, actually. And in, in August of this year, you attempted another world record. Um, that dive didn't go to plan. Can you talk us through what happened there and what you learned from the experience? Yeah. Um, when I started the, the season in 2016, uh, I was uh, always, you know, the first uh, of the first month, I was planning about uh, how it's going the schedule and what uh, competitions I would like to, to compete and etc. So, with a very uh, difficult uh, schedule of my work, I was not, I was not able to, to participate in the SEMAS European Championship for this year. And um, after that, I immediately, uh, I immediately, immediately take the decision to, to take an um, individual attempt to, to break the world record. So, at the beginning, it was, uh, the preparation was uh, quite well. It was very... I was really have a good adaptation for my training, and uh, later on, after the anaerobic uh, training sessions, it was uh, quite well for me. Went quite well for me. Uh, I was really, I was in really good shape. So I was uh, not one hundred percent sure to break the world record, but uh, ninety percent, uh, ninety-five percent sure uh, to break that. So I go to the, I went to the Belgrade, Serbia. To communicate with uh, Serbia, Serbia Federation, Free Diving Federation, and um, but in the final days, uh, start something like um, motivational issues, I think, or maybe some problem with um, overtraining, maybe. Um, and after the attempt, it was not uh, successful, of course. I finished. Uh, I decided to finish uh, early my my attempt at uh, 225 meters about 
um, just because I'm not sure to, to break the 300 meters. That's why I finished at 225 and not more. So this is the game. It happened uh, all the time for me from the past years. Um, the issue, it was about uh, motivation, um, not about physically. Physically is the easiest thing. You train every day. I train every day. Uh, I train a lot. I train very hard. But uh, this sport for diving, it's not a usual sport. It's a sport to put your lim uh, try to reach your limits, uh, and at the same time uh, you are holding your breath. You know, yeah. it's a very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to have a very good concentration in the, the very stressful time when you try to, to break your own limit or maybe to break a world record attempt. So my issue was uh, met met motivational. It was my issue, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, I mean, the way I would imagine it is that the, the training for something like this is, um, could be stressful enough at the best of times, but do you ever have it that when it comes down to the day, on the day of the competition or the day of the attempt, that anxiety becomes an issue for you too? Mm. I, I was thinking about anxiety a lot of times when I started uh, my freediving career and uh, I always uh, put extra effort uh, for my anxiety to, to have a control about the anxiety and uh, etc. But the main issue is not the anxiety for me. Uh, if you are a, a good prepared for that, the anxiety is the second reason of your uh, unsuccessful dive. Because everybody has anxious before the competition. This is not, uh, it, it just happens, okay? Uh, and with a very small steps, if you increase with a very small steps your performances and gradually increase your, your dynamic up and um, you have a very good scheduling behind, um, anxiety and anxious is uh, the second reason. It's not the primary reason. It's, it's a second reason for your unsuccessful dive. So if you're only making very small increases in distance or depth over time, then you kind of automatically have a certain confidence in your abilities. Yeah, So anxiety exactly. is, it's, the anxiety is not overwhelming when it actually comes down to the day or the attempt. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, I'm a very anxious before a competition, but uh, when, I, when I go into the water, everything is uh, freezing. And I'm concentrating only when, on the technique. Uh, small steps. Uh, I break down my, my, my race in small steps from the first construction, this is the first level, okay, about uh, 100 meter. And after that, I I'm focusing, really focusing on technique and uh, rhythm. I really focus on technique and rhythm. And um, after that, everything, everything is going on the autopilot right. until the surface. Yeah, so you have so many things to concentrate on, to place your attention on, that anxiety doesn't really have a chance to come to the surface, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what is your, your favorite discipline? I mean, uh, it seems like you concentrate mostly on um, dynamic. Do you also train no fins too? Um, I also train no fins in the beginning uh, of my freediving career. I did uh, 140 meters uh, I have a 140 meters personal best in, uh, and I did it in 2013. But my favorite discipline uh, when I started free diving was a static apnea. It was uh, the only discipline that uh, it was easy for me to achieve because I don't have equipment about a monofin. So um, I don't have a weight to put, uh, to, put my, to put on my neck to do some serious dynamic uh, performances. So um, I usually do it um, static apnea. And, in, and, from, the, and um, from 2008 until 2013, um, I really achieved very good performances in static apnea. I, was, um, sec I, I took the second place in uh, Belgrade, in either World Championship individual, who won championship, with uh, 8 minutes and 46 seconds. And uh, after that, I would like to switch uh, to switch in dynamic apnea to increase also my performances in uh, another discipline like dynamic. But actually, I would like to switch also in um, 
DNF in the in future. For this year, I would like to concentrate in uh, dynamic also. Is it possible for someone at your level to train for dynamic and also train for static apnea at the same time? Is that even possible? Mm, this is an interesting question. Uh, at the same time, it's very difficult to compare all the disciplines. But especially in dynamic and uh, in static apnea, um, it's very difficult to compare because in uh, my own schedule, I have a very different, um, how can I say, I have a very differ different approach. Uh, in dynamic apnea, you need more intense approach on your training. But uh, instead of uh, static apnea, you need to, to be more relaxed. So when I decided uh, in the past to, to compare this discipline uh, at the same time, it was a very it was very difficult to to achieve static apnea, static apnea over five minutes. It was really really difficult because I had really strong constructions early uh, and my performances. But um, when I when I was starting uh, tapering, for example, and uh, start to reduce my overall intensity and uh, starting to reduce my intensity anyway, um, actually static apnea trying starting to increase gradually, very, very fast. But at the same time, it's very difficult to compare static and dynamic in the basic, in basic, in your basic preparation. It depends, it depends on your training approach. Some, some guys uh, uh, trying, to, trying to do static and dynamic very well, and uh, compared to dynamic and static apnea, really, really good. But for me, it's uh, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. For you personally, very, it's uh, just difficult. yeah, for me yeah. personally, yeah. I need a different approach for static. Anyway, here's a practical question. Um, let's say you're a complete beginner, and um, let's say a, a beginner with a, a relatively good static apnea hold of three minutes. Okay, so somebody goes and does the first course. They do three minutes on the first day. For somebody who wanted to make a gradual, steady progress from that three minutes, is there what kind of train, basic training plan would you suggest? Would it be like traditional CO2 tables or would it be something else? Um, you know, from the beginning, everything uh, it would be easy. So if you would decide to, to do a CO2 tables or oxygen tables, uh, you have a very good adaptation at the beginning. So I would try to to suggest to train in the cell to in the cell two uh, stimulation in order to have a better con um, to have a better control on uh, constructions because it's the is the the common issue from the beginners, you know the contractions. So I would like <clears throat> to suggest to this guy to train the cell two, and after that, after four or six months or uh, to hit uh, to hit the plateau. Uh, I will change the plan uh, to more specific uh, to more specific adaptations. But uh, from the beginning, stay focused on your basics, CO2 or oxygen two tables, and uh, you will uh, increase your performances very very fast. Do you do you recommend like traditional CO2 tables or maybe something like a one breath CO2 tables? Because a lot of people say that. The, the rest times between the, the different rounds and the traditional tables are just too long and it just gives the body too much time to um, to recover. Do you agree with that? Uh, I actually used to, to train with the CO2 tables uh, from the beginning of my career, um, but not with a single breath rest between. With uh, I usually take times. So I'm not uh, focusing on uh, breaths, but on time. But uh, it has a very negative effect on my nervous system. I, um, I like to train the CO2 and the, and the CO2 adaptation uh, with the sprinting training. Sprint training, not uh, actually static apnea training. Because uh, after a sprint, you need to breathe very, very fast. So the, carbo high, uh, the CO2 levels are very high on your bloodstream. So this is a very uh, a smart and easy way to increase uh, your CO2 tolerance with your sprinting. So it's a, it's a smart to train uh, your CO2 your CO2 adaptation uh, with a sprint and apnea at the same time. Not not stable, not static. A sprinting and uh, and apnea. Uh, and then for somebody who doesn't have access to a pool. Um, 
would you then recommend like uh, maybe walking stairs um, or something like that? Mm, yes. Um, apnea walks on land, maybe uh, I prefer to do more intense workouts. I, su- I suggest to, uh, to train in on the weights with lifting training with uh, high repetitions, not uh, actually five or 10 repetitions, but more higher than uh, five to 10, like uh, two, 20 or 25 repetitions because uh, it gradually increases your lactic acid very, ma- very high. And uh, lactic acid is a friend for us. It's not an enemy. Because uh, when you have a lactic acid, you have a very good vasoconstrictions on your vessels, on your, uh, on your vessels. So, the, so muscles uh, start working without oxygen immediately. So this happens all the time in, uh, in apnea, in free diving. And if you have a very good uh, lactic acid capacity, you will be, I'm sure you will have a b- very good performances in your free diving. Uh, this is what I change when I, when I switch from my previous plan to the new one plan with my George, uh, with George Growers. We had a very, with, we had a lot of lactic acid training uh, on our plan daily. Not uh, periodically, mm-hmm. but daily. So when you're talking about um, like a high repetition lift, um, mm-hmm. you you would do that on a breath hold. Um, actually, the vessel constriction is very um, is very strong. You need to do in uh, at the same time to, to compare with the breath holding. Uh, you need to to breathe normally. Right. So just to, when just you do weight lifting, just uh, just to wait your lift, just wait your lift, not right. just holding your breath. It's not so. It's it's very dangerous. Yeah, that, that's anyway. what I was thinking. Yeah, it's um, yeah being surrounded by tons and tons of metal and uh, hard objects. Um, maybe not the best place to do a. Yeah, especially imagine a, imagine to do squats with a full breath holding and with full lungs, especially lungs. Uh, the Valsalva method is uh, is the is the main issue when you start to try to weight some lifts with uh, holding your breath. I'm sure somebody is doing it out there somewhere. Yeah, but probably but Guillaume Neri did uh, already uh, uh, this uh, this method, this uh, training method. But uh, I didn't find I didn't found any um, differences between the simple method and uh, with uh, method uh, with lifting with uh, apnea hold uh, uh, breath holding. So talking of uh, weight lifting, weight lifting, and we've just touched on that. Um, you said that. Uh, a well-structured resistance training program can greatly benefit the levels of strength, stamina, and functionality of very important muscles and joints, which play a vital role in free diving disciplines. So, what what kind of resistance training specifically do you recommend? Would that be like a, a, a full body um, lifting routine that you would do three or four times a week, something like that? Mainly, I suggest uh, for people to to train in the pool and sit on land. Okay, so, but if you don't have a pool uh, next to you, um, it's always to, to do something on, on the weightlifting. Uh, but when you will start a weightlifting training, for example, or a resistance training, uh, it's, um, it's a good to train on uh, mobility, not just the weight you lift, not just weightlifting, okay? Not just uh, lift weights, just to train your mobility, uh, to have a very good uh, joint mobility, especially in your upper part, of your body uh, and especially in your shoulders because a lack of uh, a lack of mobility your upper, uh, on your upper part especially in your shoulders uh, can uh, maybe you can give you can give you a, a negative effect on your hydrodynamic posture underwater so the main problem it's a not about the flexibility and the mobilization on your lower part of your body but on your upper part of your body, especially on your shoulders. This is the main issue because chest, chest press, chin ups, uh, pull exercises can uh, give you more, um, how can I say, uh, give you more stiff muscles on your upper body. On yeah, your the upper muscles body. can shorten over time with too much uh, yeah, lifting. So, so mm-hmm. that can also limit the mobility over time as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You need mobilization exercises on your upper part and heavy weight liftings 
lift, uh, heavy weight lifting on your lower part of your body. You need two different types of training. Not the general condition with uh, weight lifting uh, for full body workout exercises like and just like that. Would you would you say then that uh, perhaps um, some big lifts like squats and deadlifts um, for the lower body, and then maybe like uh, some more even gymnastic type movements for the upper body? Yeah, even gymnastic type movements for upper body, especially. Uh, shoulder rotations with stick or resistant bands. It's a um, swimmer technique to have a better movement on your upper part, especially in your shoulders. You have a be- very good mobilization on your shoulders. And um, you can increase with uh, mobilization exercises like a shoulder rotations um, with stick or resistant bands. And, and for the lower part, of course, you need more heavy weight lifting exercises like a squat, deadlifts, uh, sumo squats, and something like that. Um, you you studied sports nutrition, right? I get mm-hmm. that right. So, do you have a do you have a very um, disciplined and specific uh, dietary um, routine? Do you eat certain foods specifically that help you with your free diving? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh, nowadays, I, due to my nature of my work and uh, due to my nature of my specific workout routine, I try to eat a lot of carbohydrates in order to have a more glycogen in my muscles. And uh, carbohydrates break down the glucose, and uh, glucose uh, give energy to ma- to anaerobic muscle fibers. So if you're deci- if you decided if you're decided to to go to do free diving, for example, you need to have a more uh, full cover your store of uh, glucogen. Right. You don't need to waste your glucose with uh, uh, when you're trying to eat more vegetables or, for example, meat with a low carbohydrate uh, dietary work- uh, plan. Mm-hmm. You need more carbohydrates. But actually, I, I, I eat carbo carbs. Uh, fruits also um, and meat simple simple plan but uh, and I change the plan and uh, depends for when uh, when I, I go when I would like to go for a competition or I have a basic preparation depends from the preparation and uh, competition plan right um, is there anything that you you would say that a uh, that a free diver should definitely avoid in their diet? Ah, um, okay. Um, if you are close to your competition, it's uh, necessary to to try to stop uh, the drinking coffee or anything else about uh, alcohol and something like that. But um, in my basic preparation, um, I also use uh, to drink coffee and I uh, don't have any bad issues or any negative effects on, uh, on my apnea. I think it's uh, just mentally, in my opinion, okay? But before a maximum attempt, also I stopped uh, drinking coffee, of course. But uh, before, t- two days before a competition, I, um, I usually drink coffee. So there's um, some people out there who advocate a so-called alkaline diet, um, which is quite a controversial subject because um, the science um, and the details seem to be, uh, you know, don't really support the idea that we can really benefit from this so-called alkaline diet. Have you heard about mm-hmm. this and do you have an opinion yeah. about this? Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, you can increase your uh, pH in a normal average uh, when you're trying to eat more uh, alkaline foods, for example, vegetables or fruits. And of course, you, uh, this, those foods can help you to to don't have more acid on your muscles and on your body. So you can hold your breath longer and you can uh, work longer. So this is the the background idea behind the alkaline foods. So that, that that's an idea that you agree with. Mm-hmm, yeah, of course. But also, your body have uh, has your own mechanical adaptations to to restore the HP or uh, alkaline uh, levels in the same position all time. So you don't need to waste your time 
to eat a lot of fruits or a lot of vegetables. Your body needs how it's done. So your body can create the same level of HP uh, all the time. You don't need to waste your time. Right. Uh, let's say if you were eating, um, eating a lot of foods that were said to be acid forming, like uh, coffee or red meats or um, some nuts or something like that, and that was you were eating a lot of that kind of food. Would this, because the body is naturally um, coming to this homeostasis and with the blood pH, right? But because you're eating these very alkaline foods, does the extra effort that the body is making, would that um, cause more stress to the body? Mm -hmm. um, the theory behind all these things is, uh, is a right, but in practical, uh, I, do, I didn't find any differences between uh, super alkaline uh, dietary plan or to eat more meat and to drink coffee at the same time. You know what I mean? Um, so the differences in practice in practice it's not so much so I did 300 meters and dynamic apnea and eat a lot of meat and uh, eat a lot of pasta and uh, <laughs> vegetables and uh, fruits and uh, everything okay so if you if you would like to be um, a yogi style uh, so I'd uh, start to eat more vegetables and fruits but in free diving you need uh, to have the average uh, you, have, you have to eat a lot of uh, carbohydrates also, you need uh, meat for some reasons. Um, but if you would like to, to stop to eat meat, uh, um, no problem about that, but um, I didn't find any practical, uh, uh, I, didn't find any, uh, I didn't find any practical uh, advantage about that. Yeah, I find it interesting because from a purely subjective point of view, um, you know, I, I, I eat pretty much 100% plant-based diet, um, a lot of fruits and vegetables and uh, a lot of greens as well. I usually eat a, a lot of greens every day, a lot of carbohydrates like sweet potatoes and things like that. And when I maintain that diet for a longer period of time, I feel really good. But um, if for some reason my diet starts to break down and I maybe drinking too much coffee, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not eating, I'm not eating fruit and things like that, uh, often enough. Um, or maybe I start to eat, you know, because I don't have time to prepare my own food before I go to work. So I eat the, the, from the big pot of steamed rice they have at work. I really feel it. You know, I really feel like, uh, more tired, um, less motivated. It's obviously not going to do me any harm to, to believe that, uh, uh, uh a high alkaline or plant-based diet is going to do me a lot of good. Yeah, actually, I realized that uh, if you have a lower metabolic ra metabolic rate uh, due to lower calories indication of your free diet or plan, you don't have the right uh, motivation to achieve some big results in uh, in your free diving. Uh, so the biggest problem for me when uh, when, you tr when, when someone trying to to lower the calories and uh, to fix uh, the data plan is to to lower at the same time the the uh, total amount of calories. So it's uh, necessary to have a balance about calories and micronutrients about proteins, carbs, and fats in order to have a, in, in order to have a good energy on your muscles and on your nervous system, and also to have a very good uh, quality of your motivation in order to achieve something special in free diving or to break some records. So don't waste your time to um, to break down so much things about uh, lower to, uh, to to lower your calorie intake and uh, to break down also your micronutrients. Don't uh, don't start to to have lower about all these micronutrients. Yeah, yeah, I don't think at the same time. I don't think, I think it's pretty much um, people overcomplicate these things. I think that if you eat whole foods um, as they come naturally in nature and it, whether it's meat or whether it's plants, um, they are the most nutrient dense foods that you can get. And if you eat a good balance of them, a wide variety, you should be getting everything you need, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe uh, 100%. Because probably 
all this stuff is about uh, in theoretical uh, in theoretical theoretically everything is going well everything is going everything is work uh, perfect but in practical uh, you you will find some differences about the theoretical and uh, what uh, what happened in reality you know so don't waste your time about uh, alkaline foods and all this stuff your body has uh, your own mechanics mechanical uh, adaptations to have your HP in the same position all time okay so if you would like to help all these mechanical systems okay you can eat more a little bit more vegetables or fruits and uh, alkaline foods but don't waste your time to add a lot of fruits a lot of vegetables it's not worth it right yeah so you me. don't want to just uh, eat like uh, spinach three times a day and uh exactly hope for the best exactly. yeah right um i have one slightly i have one we're getting a bit technical but um i like it but uh, i'll just give you one more really technical question um, so I saw on your blog that there was a message from uh, Kurt Chambers, who's um, a freediver based in Hawaii. Uh, I think Kurt is also a, on the American team, right? Is he a, also competing for America? Mm, um, I don't remember well, but uh, it's in Hawaii. It's in, yeah. I'm not in sure. America, probably. Yeah, I'm sure he's, uh, he's he's definitely a proficient diver. That's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And he asked the question. Um, uh, I have, su I have suspected that success um, comes from boosting one's red blood cell counts, or hematocrit, which takes mm -hmm. uh, a lot of time and the right stimuli, such as low oxygen, along with the right diet. Could you explain a little bit what hematocrit is, why it's important in apnea, and how you can improve your, your red blood count? Mm -hmm. Hematocrit increased uh, due to the nature of your um, example of your uh, sport activity. If you're doing apnea training, you can increase your hematocrit and uh, the hematocrit is the red blood cells into your, into your bloodstream and he can uh, drive a lot of oxygen to your muscles, every, mu every, every, every muscles, okay? So if you have a lot of them, so you have a lot of oxygen when you're trying to do some uh, apnea, for example. You can increase your blood, uh, your blood vessels and your red, uh, red cells uh, when you're trying to do a lot of apnea training and uh, to eat the right amount of foods of, um, for example, uh, red meat, okay, uh, liver. In order to to give your bo in order to give uh, for your body to have a very good recovery and adaptation and uh, resources to, to build uh, the red cells. So if you're what trying, what exactly is mm -hmm. it about the red meat and the liver that is especially beneficial for hematocrit? Is it iron or something else like that? It's, a, it's a iron. Yes, it's a iron, and it's an um, animal protein. That means uh, the body can uh, uh, can break down very easily and uh, can increase uh, rapidly the, the amount of uh, blood cells in your vessels, in your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. But you need, of course, the right stimuli, stimulation. If you don't have the right stimulation, it's not, uh, you don't have the, the positive impact about that. You need apnea training, and at the same time, you need the right, uh, the right approach of your data. Right. Well, I'm not going to be eating any red meat or liver, so um, let's hope that... Uh I still managed to break that world record in a few years' time somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so you don't do you do much depth diving? Do you ever get the chance? Um, yeah, of course. I start my depth uh, depth uh, free diving challenge. Uh, I say at uh, two thousand and nine when I was living in Greece, and uh, so. Actually, did uh, very well uh, depth uh, depth performances. And uh, the beginning of my depth uh, career, I did uh, for the first year uh, 65 meters in constant weight. So it was uh, quite a good progress from the beginning. And uh, at the same time, I found some uh, issues on uh, lung squeezes. I did a lot of lung squeezes from the from the very first. Probably it was a, it was a, actually the the gradually depth range that I did 
So. Do you mean that you 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 were making two big jumps when you first started your depth training? Yeah, because uh, start my free diving career, uh, depth career, and I already have uh, had six, seven, thirty minutes static apnea, and also uh, two hundred minutes, uh, two hundred meters dynamic apnea. So I had a lot of apnea capacity uh, to increase the depth. So it was not my fear to to go down and uh, and run out of breath. Stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was really really focus on uh, depth but at the same time i had some issues about lung squeezes and um, uh, equalization problems but i resolved all these problems when i start uh, taking two steps back and start again to change the program again with slower steps on the on the depth you know start slowly slowly i did uh, my first uh, training camp in sandorini with stavros kastronakis since 2011 uh, in 2011 and uh, in my first uh, world championship competition depth world championship competition i did uh, 101 meters in, uh, in kalamata at the world championship so it was a huge step forward for me in depth yeah that's massive already massive yeah. Already, it was 100 meter. It was um, uh, not quite easy. Apnea was really, really good, but uh, the problem for me was the chest flexibility from the beginning of my career, and that affects on equalization also. So the limit was uh, uh, 90 to 100 meter for me, and not the apnea. Just it was the equalization problem. <clears throat> so, do you plan to? Um, you said that you plan to switch over to uh, DNF, um, perhaps at some point in the future. Do you also have plans to, I was talking to, for example, uh, Goran Jolak, who's now um, starting to focus a lot more on the depth disciplines. Is that something that you'll also do yourself? Uh, at some point, yes, I will always, uh, I would like to, to switch in the, the depth also, but the main problem for me here in Cyprus is to have not uh, so much safety around me. Because uh, other guys is not so, for example, professional like me. It's I'm thinking about very serious uh, for uh, my training and my training preparations. But all these guys here in Cyprus are professors, professor men, and it's very difficult to <laughs> to explain uh, uh, to go for uh, for depth training. So uh, they said to me, depth training? What is, what is that? So let's go for spare fishing. But uh, <laughs> I, need to, I need to go for a training camp uh, like, uh, 2000, uh, like 2011 in order to have a good, serious uh, depth uh, progress. Yeah, so hopefully at some point in the future, the circumstances about where you live and um, who you can train with will improve. So you'll be in a position yeah. to focus more thoroughly on the depth training yeah yeah it's very difficult to train in depth um, you need to go for a preparation uh, or training cup if you if you would like to be more serious in depth and uh, that's why i my i've um, uh, i'm stick focused on uh, or pulled preparation because it's uh, very close to me uh, i can i can do it daily so that's why I, uh, that's why i decided to train in a pool and not in depth but in the future, who knows? Maybe I have the the good uh, the the possibility to to train in depth with some good friends in uh, somewhere. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, because I like a lot of uh, because I like a lot of depth training. I missed a lot. From the from the depth disciplines, do you have a favorite one? Depth disciplines, yes, the constant weight, constant weight, and um, and free immersion, constant weight, free immersion, CNF, I am. I don't. Uh, I didn't make uh, some decision to, to change in uh, DNF, but uh, I'm really focusing on uh, constant weight and free immersion because I'm a specialist in monofin, and uh, I don't want to waste time to to change my mentality in order to dive deep, because I would like to train in uh, constant weight, really, really, really do constant weight dives because I would like to. Do, I would like to go deep. And uh, this is the only way to dive deep is the constant weight and free immersion. Hopefully, we can see you see you break a record in constant weight at some point. Who knows? It's a, it's a very difficult because you need more adaptation. 
in uh, in depth anyway it's not uh, just to hold your breath and to, to go okay you have a lot of pressure you need to have a good adaptation and localization and uh, that takes time that takes time this is the main problem and you need of course the safety team you need of course um, the environment you need to be relaxed you need to have a lot of time to to train and to to strict on uh, on the depth it's another story depth training is another story talking about adaptation over time to to depth what do you think is adapting to depth do you think it's um the physical capacity of uh, the, the 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 for the blood shift to happen the um other kinds of adaptation in the muscles what's your thoughts about that mm -hmm. um uh, about depth the most common issue is uh, the rv residual volume in my opinion because uh, when you reach your residual volume if this is the very uncommon feeling you have when you dive deep and if you training well your rv your residual volume you will be able to dive deep deeper than uh, previous uh, training approach if you have a different training approach uh, but physical conditioning it's uh, you need to have the in the basic uh, in the basic preparation anyway you you need to have a very good physical conditioning in order to dive deep but the main issue when you're trying to dive deep is your residual volume if, when you're trying to to train your residual volume immediately starting to improve your equalization if you have equalization problems and start to improve your uh, responses for example diving response you have a better diving response and you are able to dive deeper so the pyramid uh, of your training approach first it will be your on the top it will be your rv training or frc training in order to to increase your flexibility uh, on land you can do stretching uh, stretching routine especially with empty lungs it's not worth it to do stretching with full lungs because it's not happened on uh, the real environment for example in the depth okay so rv uh, rv training or frc training uh, stretching with empty lungs and of course on the base of your pyramid your physical condition in physical condition maybe means aerobic training or maybe anaerobic training but in depth you have rv stretching within the lungs and physical condition. Talking about relaxation, um, do you have any kind of specific mental training that you do, such as um, visualization or some kind of meditation that you think is extremely valuable in your training? Um, before I start, uh, two, two months before I went to Belgrade, in order to break the world record attempt, I started to to train my mentally, uh, my mental uh, power. So I start to to to, to train uh, with a traditional method of um, mental training. That means um, for my for my for me, mental training means uh, to think your performances and to break down with the small steps. So I start increasing my mental power in order to have more relaxation, not to be a yogi style but just to be more ready in, at, the, at a specific time to break a record or to, to reach my limit. The, the main problem when, it, when you're trying to break your limit is mentally. So it was my main issue. Anyway, my mental is my main issue, not physical, but mentally. So I try to think, um, to think my performance with the small steps and trying to imagine as hard as it possible. Just like to, to stay focused before I start uh, my attempt. Okay, and I'm in the national pool in, uh, near, next to me, in my, anyway, in, in my pool, and start thinking about, uh, now I imagine to, to be on the, on the competition uh, stage. Okay, and start visualizing all this stuff, and start countdowning, uh, countdown uh, uh, into myself, until the official top and then start my performances and uh, I'm doing that all time in order to be more relaxed in the real environment. 
And did you say that you, um, when you visualize your dive, you try to visualize the dive being as difficult as possible? Um, yes, as, dif as difficult as possible, but successful at the end. Not negatively affect or not negatively response. And is when this is this in the hope yes. that when you actually do carry out the dive, that it actually might even be easier than what you've visualized? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You need to do to stay more real, you know, not to not to confuse your brain. Okay, it's difficult. Try to to thinking about it, but after that, you're a winner, not a loser. Yeah, so you, you don't try and imagine yourself, you visualize the dive as if you're just uh, gracefully swimming through the pool, you know, like uh, reading a book or listening to some uh, beautiful self music or something like that. You have to keep it real. You have to keep it real, yes. In order to have a, in order to have a good results in final, you know. This is what I, what I used to, this is what I used to, but uh, I need a lot of practice. Right. In this meditation, so this is still this work in progress for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, I wrote something on my blog about mental preparation uh, and how you can improve or how you can approach your mental preparation compared with your physical preparation or compared with your uh, general training. So you will find there a lot of information about that. Yeah. So if anyone's listening, I'll I'll put a link to that uh, blog article. Uh, in the show notes for this episode, do you are there any people in your life that have particularly inspired you? I mean, like not necessarily necessarily free divers, but who are the people that have inspired you most? My people inspired the most is my my coach also. Okay, so he's uh, believing me until I believe myself first. So he also encouraged me to, to try to reach my, my best uh, in competitions and generally in life, not only in competitions, because for diving it's not only a sport, it's um, about, it's about um, something more special. And it's uh, different about, uh, about people, okay? It's not the same time. Um, also, I have my girlfriend who is supporting me all the time, uh, Andre Costandino is my girlfriend right now, and uh, he's supporting me all the time with competitions and uh, with the daily schedule. Uh, he comes to me in the pool sometimes before he goes to she go, he go, she goes to to the work, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a routine for us, and then he helps me a lot. Of course, uh, people help me from Athens when I was uh, at a very young age. Uh, some people in the national federation, uh, Aida Las, he helps me. He helped me a lot in order to increase my my performances and to read and to to, to read more about physiology and to, to learn more uh, training uh, approach, all this stuff. So I'm very happy to have all these uh, people around me and help me to to be the best uh, in daily in all aspects of my life. You know. And your girlfriend, is she a pool, is, does she a uh, free dive also? And no, uh, it's not a, it's not a free diver. Uh, he, uh, she tried, she was tried uh, two years before, and uh, he did, she did very well uh, performances in the static apnea because he he had a very a positive effect on the mental because he's an accountant, accountant, in his uh, in his business. So uh, he felt she felt very very good when he did uh, static apnea and he did she did um, um, two minutes two thirty and uh, she's uh, she's surprised she's surprised and she liked she liked a lot uh, but most important is she liked to um, to help me to help me to in the basic uh, on my basic operation and the basic plan. And he supported me very well. Yeah, so she's very understanding of this uh, crazy sport that you take part in. Exactly. Yeah, you're lucky because okay. I think uh, not everybody would be as lucky. Yeah, as I'm, very lucky. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. You said that free diving was not just a sport, but something else. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Like, 
you said it's something special for each person. How, how do you how do you mean by that? Um, for me, actually, for that means not uh, just holding my breath. It's about honing my skills, and uh, I become better connected with myself. This is my motto and my philosophy about free diving. So, um, free diving can improve my all aspects of my life. Can improve my daily schedule. Uh, I'm more motivated. Um, I'm more and more um, sticked on the difficulties. I try to express myself. Uh, I try to to be more confident and all this stuff. Okay. Right. So free diving is. Um like a, it's like a passion for free, me. Free diving is is mm. a kind of like the the central point in your life, but it uh, the influence of free diving is reaching out into all other aspects of your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? Would you say free diving is like a, a spiritual practice for you? Um, it was not in the beginning, but it's happened along the way. Uh, when I start free diving. Uh, I would imagine the free diving as a sport, as a very extreme sport. And uh, during my progress uh, of free diving, of the sport of free diving, I start to, to see, I start seeing the free diving as a spiritual sport because it improves my mental strength and mental experience to to avoid some difficulties in my in my in my life generally. Mm -hmm. This is the point of me. This so is the point of you. Such a having such a positive benefit to all other aspects of your life that it's a kind of a holistic yeah. thing and therefore mm -hmm. a spiritual thing as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's not it's not a yogi style uh, spiritual routine, uh, but it helps me to improve my strengthening into my in my in my mental strengthening, my mental strength in order to avoid some difficulties in uh, in a life. Right. That's it. Yeah, well, I mean that uh, that mental strength can translate mm -hmm. into how you interact with other people, which can improve your relationships, which yeah. can improve your whole life and how satisfied you are with your life. So, in that sense, it really is a, a spiritual practice, yeah. then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I'm, I cooperate uh, with a lot of people each day, every day, every single day, and um, if you don't have my free diving in my life. It will be very difficult to avoid all these uh, difficulties and issues and uh, some strange persons around me. So free diving helps me <laughs> helps me to avoid all this stuff. So I'm very grateful to have free diving in my life. Um, do you have like a morning ritual? Is there something that you do every morning that when you wake up, or do you just get up and go for it? I hate to wake up early in the morning <laughs> in order to go to training. But you have to do but, it all uh, the time. You have to do it every day. Yeah, yeah, every every single day, every single day. But uh, you know, uh, I don't have any spiritual routine. Uh, the only spiritual routine I have is to wake up on from my bed and to go to to the kitchen and to to to, to prepare something to drink. All right. And after that, I go to, to the pool. And maybe sometimes I did uh, stretching routine in the morning, but not every day. And, but when I, when I have some competitions before, uh, before that, uh, I start to do more stretching routine in the morning. So this is, a, as I said, a spiritual uh, routine. Do you, uh, I see on your website that you also offer um, online coaching services. Um, what exactly do you offer? How does the online coaching work? My online coaching work, um, I start officially in September for this month. Uh, also, I start, also, I, I refreshed my website, you know, in order to be more uh, friendly on uh, mobile and uh, yeah. something like that. It's more, it's yeah, more, it looks very nice. You have a really nice website now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, basically, in my online coaching, I offer uh, my experiences to the audience and to the clients. So there you can find a lot of uh, packages to, um, to start our communication with me. And uh, you can also, I can also offer for you a nutrition plan, individual training plan every month, Skype meetings, um, whatever you want, okay? You can find everything you want in order to have a better, uh, better performances for the future. 
And the most important thing is to have the personal communication to each other, as we as we're trying to do right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is that something that you only offer to more experienced divers, or would like for for me, example, a mere normal mortal human being with a, a yeah. very amateur free diver? Um, is that yeah. open to me also? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I think um, I like to work with people who have uh, who they have your own uh, your own level of free diving, not so much um, elite free divers because elite free divers has uh, their own routine, so it's a very difficult to change mindset. So I would like people to have open mindset, open mind, okay, in order to adapt my personal experience and my personal approach uh, well maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll take you up on the uh, coaching um, offer at some point then I will have to have to have you in my team nice <laughs> um, what are your plans for the future do you have any any goals or any uh, dreams that you want to see fulfilled in the coming months and years um, I'm planning to have uh, a good season in uh, dynamic apnea. I would like to compete in the uh, AIDA individual pool world championship this this year. I will try to because it's very difficult with my with my working schedule with a very demanding schedule in my in my working life. But I will try to, to compete. It's my main uh, main goal. But uh, after that, I would like to switch and uh, turn it to a depth training. In order to break the the national record in Costa Rica in the free immersion, probably the main goal here here in depth training it will be in uh, Amorgos on September, a very very interesting event. This is the uh, the authentic big blue competition, right? Authentic yeah. big blue competition where the, where the story begins in uh, uh, in all free divers. You know. So this uh, this competition took place for the first time um, last month, right? Um, yeah. Last so your plan would be to um, attempt to break the national record at next year's competition. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm planning to. I'm planning to also to um, the main the main uh, the main focus is on uh, to start train in the deep in different approach in a different training, you know, because the pool is always starting um, boring yourself uh, when you're doing a lot a lot of time in a long way in a long term of way so sometimes you need to, to turn the situation and to try to try to do something different in order to have a better motivation something like that that's that's why i, I would I will try to do this mm. well i wish you a lot of success um then at the competition next year Thank i'll be cheering you. for you Thank you very much. What is the what is the the Greek national record standing at at the moment? Standing at the moment, you mean in depth? In depth, uh, this yeah, time? yeah. Depth. I already have the constant weight national record. It's one hundred and two meters. Right. I did it in two thousand thirteen in the Ida individual depth for championship, and at the same time I did uh, ninety two meters in free immersion. So I have two national records in depth. 102 in constant weight and uh, 92 meters in in free immersion. All right, so you already have the national record, so you're just going to break your own records. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd like to prove it. <laughs> well, all the best with that. Thank you very much, my yeah. friend. Thank you very much. Um, just before we uh, wrap up the interview, where can people find you online? Of course, I'm going to link to your uh, your website in the show notes. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a YouTube channel? Do you have um, Facebook and things like that? Yeah, I have uh, my official website. It's uh, com, And there, everyone ha uh, will find more information about uh, my experience, my personal blog, that I will discuss uh, every month a uh, lot of topics in free diving about training and uh, everything like that. And of course, in my Facebook, uh, my personal Facebook account is George Panagiotakis, and my official Facebook page is uh, Yorgos Panagiotakis. Great. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you or find out more about you, then uh, they can uh, start searching for that now, or they can head over to the show notes where I'm going to put all the information. 
Do you get the chance to read a lot? Do you have any books or authors that you would like to recommend to the listeners and to myself? Because um, I'm always really interested to find out uh, what what the favorite books of our freedivers are. Yeah, um, actually, I didn't read a lot of uh, freediving books. Um, any I read kind of book, any kind of subject, any kind, any kind of, kind of any genre, yeah. subject. I like to to read more motivational books like uh, Anthony Robbins. And uh, also my favorite book is uh, about uh, mo- a gorilla mindset. It's a very interesting book about how to motivate yourself and how to, to express yourself in order to, to reach another limit of uh, your spirituality. And this is, you know? what is the name of this book? A gorilla mindset. A gorilla mindset. And do you know the name of the author too? Um, I don't remember well, but uh, I, w- I will send you the the author. It's okay. Yeah, yes. you can send me it, or I'll find it, and we'll uh, yeah, link yeah, to course. it in the show notes. Yeah. Thank you for. I know you have a busy day and a super busy schedule. Thank you so much for uh, rescheduling with me and working with me. Uh, it's been really amazing talking to you. We really got into the uh, into the nitty gritty details of the the training uh, and also covered all other aspects of free diving that I could hope to have talked to you about. Um, It was a really interesting talk. Um, Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah, I hope you do. I hope you do. I would like to thank you very much, uh, very much you too, because you give me the opportunity to talk talk with you, to communicate with you and to to share the knowledge to other people and other divers around around the world. So keep it up, keep the good, keep up the good work and uh, We'll talk to you again. Thank you so much. For sure. That's what it's about. It's about sharing the knowledge. So thank you for helping me do that. You do it very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was George Panagiotakis joining me through the interwebs from Cyprus. For those of you who are interested to hear about George's coach, Mr. George Yorgas, he has already recorded an interview and will be on the show in a few weeks. So we'll get to hear both sides of that world record story and lots more in-depth knowledge about freediving, training and lifestyle. Did you like the episode? Let me know. I'm on Facebook as Donnie Mac, D-O-N-N-Y-M-A-C. My Instagram is Donnie McFar, D-O-N-N-Y-M-C-F-A-R. Feel free to add me and get in touch with questions and suggestions. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And as always, dive safe.